In this video, we will dive deeper into multiple regression and learn about the process by which we decide to keep or exclude certain feature variables. Hello and namaste. My name is Brandon and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are new to the channel, it is great to have you. If you're a returning viewer, it is great to have you back. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates, colleagues, or friends, or anyone else you think might benefit from watching. So now that we are introduced, let's go ahead and get started. So of course, the first thing we should do is understand the data we're gonna use in this video. So this is housing data that's loosely based off house prices and features in the general area where I live. So it's a mix of real world data, and then I've made some changes to it for this example. So our dependent variable, our target variable, or our Y variable is the price of a house. And I will use the terms target and dependent variable probably interchangeably, but most people are using target nowadays because that's kind of what's used in machine learning applications. So the price of the house is our Y variable or our target variable. Then we have four feature variables. X1 is the square footage of the home. X2 is a binary variable about whether or not that home is in an exemplary school district, which is an umbrella term, sort of a composite term, based on certain criteria of the high school that's in that area. X3 is the number of bedrooms in the home. And X4 is the number of bathrooms in the home. And our sample size here is an even 100 observations. So look at the first 10 rows, it looks like this. So on the left, we have our target variable, which is price in thousands. So our first house there has a value or a price of 89,000 US dollars. Square footage is there in the second column. That's our X1 variable. So that first home is about 1,100 square feet. Exemplary high school is X2. So zero, no, one is yes. Beds, so one bedroom, bathroom, two bathrooms. So this is the first 10 rows of our data set. So first, let's take a couple minutes to refresh our memory about some fundamental ideas. The first idea is the total sum of squares in regression models. So SST, or the total sum of squares, is the sum of the square distances from the mean model, which in two dimensions is a horizontal line having a slope of zero at the mean of the Y or target variable and each observation. So in two dimensional space, if we just draw a line, a flat line, starting at the y-axis, and it's at the mean of the target variable, we draw it straight over, and then the SST is the distance from that line to each point, we square it and then add them all up. So remember, that's the total sum of squares. Once the data is locked in with regards to the total number of observations, which are rows, the total sum of squares is set. So SST is a finite sum that does not change regardless of how many features are part of the regression model. So total sum of squares is not feature dependent, it is row dependent. So feature variables partition or they allocate, they kind of separate the total sum of squares to the model and then the remaining sum of squares are placed in the error or the residual. So as features are added or removed, the partitioning of SSE, which is error, and SSR, which is some squares of regression or the model, will almost certainly change. Now we'll pause here to point out that these acronyms sometimes change depending on which book you're looking at, which resource you're looking at, but I have grown up learning regression using SST for sum of squares, the total sum of squares, SSE for sum of squares due to error, and SSR for sum of squares due to regression, so that's the model. So just keep in mind, these might be a little bit different depending on what else you're looking at. Also, how the sum of squares is allocated to each feature within SSR will change as the model changes. So the model is a living, breathing thing. We put a feature in and then the rest of the features will change or shift because of the presence of the feature we just put in. And you'll see that as we go. If no features have significant explanatory power, on our target variable, the model will have zero features and the best prediction will always be the mean of the target variable, which is that horizontal line with of course a slope of zero. 
And I've covered this extensively in my other regression videos. So you can go back and watch those and I'll post those either in the description or in the card at the top. Total sum of squares partition. SST is then split into SSR, which is the regression sum of squares, and SSE, the residual sum of squares due to error. Now remember that R squared value we always see in regression output is just SSR over SST. It is the proportion of the sum of squares that we are able to put in the model. The goal is to maximize SSR as a proportion of SST and to minimize SSE as a proportion of SST. So it's an optimization problem. We're trying to minimize the error because the more error we squeeze out of the model, the better it does at fitting our data and we can make better predictions up to a point, And we'll get to that here in a second. So SSR is then split among the features in the model. So if we have three variables or four or five, however many end up in the model, the SSR, the sum of squares due to the regression are allocated or split among all those features. And they are done so in terms of their relative explanatory power. So not only is SSR likely to change, but also the allocation of SSR to each feature in the model as features are added or removed. So like I said, as we add a feature, the other allocations might change or probably will change, add another feature and then they'll change again. So it's a living, breathing thing. So just a quick example. Here is a single variable output from Excel. And you can see on the left, we have one variable. That's why the degree of freedom for the regression is one that tells us how many variables are in the model. And over here on the right, we have all four variables in the model. So what I wanna point out here is that regardless how many variables we put in the model, the total sum of squares in this case is 552777. And you can see that in the total sum of squares for both. So that just reinforces that the total sum of squares is set so long as our rows and our data stays the same. So I'll talk about overfitting really quickly. So if you study machine learning and other types of things, you've already encountered this idea of overfitting. So it's good to review it here real quick in terms of regression, and then you can apply it elsewhere. So as more features are added to the model, SSR will never decrease. i say that again. As more and more features are added to the model, SSR, the sum of squares due to regression, will never decrease. SSR can only stay the same or increase. So as additional features are added, the model begins to shape itself to the data it is based on or trained on. It keeps optimizing and regression will take every variable you can throw at it. It'll eat them all up and try to squeeze out as much error as possible. So the model seeks to squeeze out as much SSE as possible, whether the feature adds predictive power or not. Complex regressions and other models could suffer on new data because the nooks and the crannies and the idiosyncrasies and all the little things that are unique about that data set will be teased out from the regression model. And when we go to put that on new data, those aren't there. And then the model doesn't fit new data very well. Now there are techniques we can implement to avoid overfitting. I'm just gonna go over these really quickly. We have model building procedures, which we'll do future videos on. So you've probably heard of forward selection, backward elimination, stepwise regression, best subsets regression. And along with those, we have certain criteria to choose the best model. So AIC, AICC, the BIC, the BC, Mallows. And you've probably seen these on regression output if you've done multiple regression in the past. So that's one way we can avoid overfitting or to use those techniques. Another way is regularization, such as L1 and L2. So lasso and ridge regression that penalize complex models. In this case, especially L1 or lasso, because what that does is it penalizes complex models. It forces coefficients of variables down to zero, eliminates those features altogether, and it creates a simpler model. We also have cross-validation where we can take our data set, split it up into equal parts. We can train our model on the bigger part and then test it on the smaller part. And we do that with the other sections that we do. So that's a way to avoid overfitting because we expose our model to different parts of the data set and we kind of average it all together. We also have PCA or principal component analysis. And I have a star by this one. So if you're familiar with what PCA is, 
So PCA can take many, many features, many variables, and compress those down into what I think of as super variables. So it'll take certain features that are correlated with each other and it'll put those in a set and then maybe some other in a set and it will create them in a way so those components are in space as distant from each other as possible. So that's kind of the way it works. Now, I put the star here because what can happen with PCA is that it works up to a point because if you create a lot of principal components, what happens is the regression model that's based on the components can start to have the same problems. So instead of having too many variables and it begins to overfit, you can have too many components and it starts to overfit again, that time based on components. So you kind of have to keep track of how many components you're creating with PCA to simplify the model because you might just create more problems by having too many components. So just keep that in mind. So where do we start? Step one, evaluate single features. So what we have here is we have our target variable, which is the house price. We're gonna test that against all four of our features separately. So we have a process, we evaluate all four of these models, these single feature models. We find the large F values in the regression output. We ask ourselves: is the P value generated from that test less than 0 0.05? And if yes, we keep that variable and then compare it to the others. Now I will say here that this value of 0 0.05 is actually up to the analyst. So if you want to set a very high bar for a variable to stay in your model, you could make this 0 0.01 or even smaller, it's really up to you. Or if you want a more open sort of liberal model, you can make this 0 0.10 and that will let more in. So you can kind of think of this as a, a hyperparameter in a way that you can set based off how strict or how loose you want to be with allowing a variable to enter. And in this case that we'll talk about later, stay in the model. So this is really up to you, but we're going to choose the happy medium here of 0 0.05 that we're all familiar with. So to make this easier, I went in Excel and ran all of these. So I'll go ahead and put those up. We can compare them. So what we have in the top left is a regression with the square footage, lower left regression with just exemplary high school, upper right regression with number of bedrooms and lower right number of bathrooms. So the first thing we wanna do is look at all the F values. So we can see that square footage is by far the highest. And then we have number of bedrooms in the top right looks like the next highest. Then we have lower left exemplary high school is next. And then number of bathrooms comes in last. So next we look at the significance or the p-value, which is that last number there. As you can see, all those numbers are very, very small, except for the number of bathrooms. So what we do is pick the smallest p-value or significance that goes with the highest f. So in this case, that is square footage. And we can rule out number of bathrooms because the significance is 0 0.32, which is much higher than 0 0.05. So in this case, square footage wins. And that will be the first variable to enter our multiple regression model. Now I'll point out here just for the sake of where these numbers are coming from. If you look at the total degrees of freedom in each of the output, that is the number of observations of 100 minus one, so that's n minus one. The regression degrees of freedom are the number of features that we have in the model. So it's one in each one of these cases. And then finally we have SSE degrees of freedom. That's n minus p minus one. So n is 100 observations, p is the number of variables we put in, which is one, and then minus one. That's why the residual degrees of freedom are 98. Now I also did this in a statistics software uh, application called JUMP. So JMP, we pronounce it JUMP, and it's actually from SAS. So if you look in this little applet thing they have in there, and I'll probably show that at some point later in a different video, you'll see that these numbers match. So the F ratio it has here for square footage is 152.175, exact same as before. Exemplary high school is 26, bed 69, seven, or about 70, and bathroom 0 0.973. Those are the exact same numbers we had in the previous screen. So we can use, and I often use more than one program just to double check myself, but you can see here that all the numbers match. So to get that F in Excel, you have to square the T. So here, in jump, we get this F ratio, but in Excel and our output, we don't get that. So if you ever want to get that, all you have to do is square this T stat. So here for square foot, 
if you go to tstat, 8.76 squared is 76.737. If you go up to the top and jump, you see 76.738, you know, with rounding. So if you want your Fs in Excel for each of the variables, each of the features, just square your T. Step two, evaluate the two feature models. So we know that X1's in and it's gonna stay in. So now we gotta match that with each of the other remaining variables. So X2, X3, and X4. Now in this example, once a feature is kept, it stays in the model. So what we're doing here is actually step-by-step -step forward selection regression. So once the variable is in, once the feature is in, it stays, then we go from there. So same process. We note the change in the error to see if the error goes down significantly. And we'll talk about how to measure that here in a minute. We find the largest F to keep like we did before. Look at the significance value, the P value, and then we keep it. Same process. Do you see how this works? We get the first variable, it's in. Then we look at the next variable and see from there if we're gonna keep it or not. Now the way we test whether or not adding a variable matters is using an F test. Now this slide's gonna look very colorful and very mathy, but it's just, I've just done it so you can tell where everything is at, so don't freak out. So the F test looks like this. It's a fraction, and then the numerator is also a fraction. So on the top of the top, we have the SSC of the model with the fewer features, then we subtract the SSC of the model that has the more features. It's just subtracting the two SSCs. Then we divide by the number of features we added in that second model, very simple. And then we divide that by the mean square error of the model that has the more features in it. And that's it. So all we have to do is just find these numbers in our output and just do some simple math. So it's important to note, again, this is a characteristic of regression, the SSE with more features will never be greater than the SSE of fewer features. So SSE can only go down or stay the same. So if SSE fewer features than the red equals the SSE of the model with the more features, if they're the exact same, then the additional features did not reduce the error at all. So that feature or features you added were useless as far as the model is concerned. So they didn't reduce the error at all. Everything in this fraction turns to zero. So F equals zero. And then the probability, the P value of F equals zero is actually one, which of course is as high as it can get. So it would just, we'd be done. So remember that SSE fewer features minus SSE more features would either be zero or positive because the SSE more features is almost certainly gonna be lower, but it could be, it could be the same, but will probably in most cases be smaller than the SSE fewer features. And there are degrees of freedom for this F test because an F test like many has a degrees of freedom component. It has number of features added. So we can see that up there at the top. And then we have degrees of freedom for the mean square error more features. And again, we just get these from the output. We just gotta know where to find them. And then once we have F up at the top and the degrees of freedom, which remember an F test has a numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, then we can look it up in a table, go online, we can use Excel to find the probability that goes along with that. So F to keep, but maybe not the best. So here we have our model with just square footage. We did that a few slides ago. Now we have a model that has square footage and exemplary high school in the model. So some things to point out here. You'll notice that our sum of squares, the residual sum of squares, which is our error sum of squares, went from 216537 down to 194207. So uh, we reduced error, which is the goal of regression and many other types of models. So we can see that it did go down we can see that our mean square didn't change a whole lot. So 2209 versus 2002. Our F went from 152 down to about 89.55, somewhere in there. And both of these models overall are significant. You can see that the significance there is a very small number. Now, how do we put these two things together? Remember, we're just finding certain things in the output and putting it into this fraction over here. SSC fewer features minus SSC more features. I've color coded them so you can find them. Number of features added. Well, we just added one variable. And then the mean square error for the more features is there in the blue, which is down in the lower left. All we do is put in the numbers and do some simple math. 
So we have 216,537 over here on the left in the top, minus 194,208, which is in the purple down here in the lower left, and then divided by one because we added one feature. Then we divide all that by the MSE of more features, which is 2002 over here in the lower left. So we do out the math and we end up with an F value or an F statistic of 11.15, an F ratio of 11.15. We have degrees of freedom of one in 97. Well, where do those come from? Remember the one is number of features added. The 97 is the degrees of freedom with the residual error term in the model with more features. So it's green there. You can see the green 97 over here in the lower left. So we can use Excel, the f.dis.write tail. You can do an online, there are many online tools, whatever you want to use. We can find the probability. So the probability is 0 0.00119. So what can we conclude here? Well, if our criteria to include exemplary high school in the model is 0 0.05, then this would qualify. I wanna use that term specifically. It could qualify to be in the model because it's below that threshold. So notice that we are averaging the change in SSE over the number of features added. So if you look at the top of that F ratio at the top, you can see that we have SSE fewer minus SSE more features divided by number of features. So we'll learn later that we can actually add more than one feature. And what we're doing is sort of averaging it over the number of features we, we added. Now here is the jump output. And you can see here, what I've highlighted is the same value here. So 11.153. And this jump applet, um, interactive applet thing they have is really cool because the way it works is it tells you what's coming next. So you can see here that we've selected square footage. We've entered that into the model. And then it says, okay, well, you enter square footage into the model. Here's what's gonna happen next. So you get the F ratio for the other three variables, which is pretty cool. But it matched what we did before, so we know we're doing it correctly. So this is just the same thing we just did. So we went from X1 to a model of X1 and X2. We've already done this. So you can see it right there. So 11.5. One five. Now here is X1 and X3. So we could go back and find all the output numbers, but just trust me, they're all, they're all correct. So we subtract the two sum of square errors. We have 50438 divided by 1712. That gives us an F ratio of 29.46. We find that probability, that p-value. It's very, very small. It's less than 0.0001. And we can see that over here in the jump output as well. So we have an F ratio of 29.456. So we know we're doing it uh, properly. And of course, like, as I said, that probability over there is very, very small. Now notice that this F ratio is higher and therefore the probability is lower than the X2 model. And then finally we have X1 and X4. So we do the same thing. We have an F ratio of 1.82 which is very small, that leads to a p-value of 0 0.18. So over here, we can see the same thing in the jump output. Now, of course, because that p-value is 0.18, we're not gonna be able to include that in the model at this stage. So we can actually kind of roll that one out. So if we go to our next slide, does any feature get to stay, and if so, which one? So here we have our three candidates models, X1 and 2, X1 and X3, and then X1 and X4. So what were the changes? So the change in sum of square due to error was about negative 22,000 for the X2 edition, negative 50,000 for the X3 edition, and then the about negative 4,000 for the X4 variable. So which one reduced the error more though the most? Well, X3 did, right? Now look at the F ratios. The one with X3 and X1 had the highest F ratio. And of course, it also had the smallest P value. Now, remember our criteria was 0 0.05. So either one of these would qualify to be in the model next. However, in this case, X3 wins. 
because it has the highest F ratio, it reduced the error the most, and it has the smallest P value. Now, where do we go? So we know that we're at the X1 and X3 and building our model. So now we have to see whether or not X2 will go into the model or X4, because remember, they're still off to the side. However, they're still out there and we can try to put them in the model. They didn't get in yet. They didn't like win the prize yet, but they can get in later and that's important. So we'll, we'll see those real quick. Now, let's point out here that our new sum of square to the error or SSE is 166099. So by adding X1 and then X3, we have lowered our SSE down to 166099. All right, so now what about adding X2? So here's the math. I'm not gonna read all the way through it. You can pause and, and read it. But we end up with an F ratio 11.87, p-value 0.00085. And we can see that here in the jump output as well. So we can look between the two to make sure they are the same and they are. And because the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we know that this is a candidate to be included in our model. What about X4? Now we have an F ratio of 1.545, p-value of 0 0.22. You can see that here in the jump output, but of course it does not get in the model. It does not qualify because the p-value is 0 0.22. Therefore, X4 does not get to stay since the p-value is not achieved. Since X2 did pass that threshold, it gets to stay. And now our model, is X1 plus X2 plus X3. Now we could try X4 one more time to see if when everything shifted, if now it's significant. So we can go ahead and test it. There's no harm in that. So we can go ahead and do that. We have an F ratio of 1.15, p-value of 0 0.286. Of course, that's not gonna cut it. So the number of bathrooms will not be in our model at all. So, X4 fails to achieve threshold at last chance, and the model stays. X1, X3, and X2, and X4 is left out of the regression model completely. So what about more than one feature? We do not always have to enter features one at a time. Models can be compared adding features as a set. So we're basically comparing two different models that have a difference between them of more than one variable. But a very important rule in this case, all features in the less complex model must be present in the more complex model. So it must be nested. So what I mean by that, if you look at this top one here, if we go from X1 to a model that has all four, well, we can do that because X1 is in both. Now, underneath that, we have a model on the left that's X1 and X3, but on the right, we don't have X3 in there. So we could not do that. It has to be nested. So we can compare models with more than one feature difference between them, but the model has to be nested. Everything in the less complex has to be in the more complex. So now we'll add X3 and X2 as a set. But everything here works the same. The only difference is that we've added two features in this step. So the number of features added instead of one is now two but everything else is the same. So we can do the math. We end up with an F ratio of 22.31 and a p-value is less than 0 0.0001. So adding these two variables as a set does qualify, it is significant. So we can see the change here. Now, what we can do is double check everything with jump and our math over here. So you notice that SSE fewer features at the top is 216537. The SSE of the more features is 147814. So with rounding, of course, and we can see that that matches. We're double checking our math here, that our SSEs are the same. We know we added two variables, obviously. Next, we can also check that our MSE is correct. So the 1540, if we take our more complex model, we have an SSE of 147815 approximately. If we divide that by our degrees of freedom for the error, which is 96, we will get 
1540. So again, we can double check that number. And then finally, in the jump output, we have the root mean square error of 39.24. Now what we can do with that is double check that number. So the 39.24 is the RMSC, the root mean square error. Well, that's the MSC, the square root of the MSC. So the square root of 1540 should be 39.24, and of course it is. So this is a way to double check the math. We can check the Excel output with the jump output and just make sure that everything is working properly. And as you can see, it is. So adding these two variables as a set is valuable. It is statistically significant. Now what about adding X4? Remember X4 didn't get in the show last time. You know, it's sitting out on the sidelines somewhere. It didn't get in the big game. Now, what if we add it with X3 as a set? Well, as you can see here, we end up with an F ratio of 15.34, a p-value that's less than 0.001. So what's happening here? All right, double check our math. We can see that our SSE fewer and SSE uh, more features are correct. We can also see that the SSE of the complex model divided by the degrees of freedom of that error is 1703, we can double check that. And of course the square root of 1703 is our RMSE, which is 41.26, so we can double check that. Now here's what's interesting. Now X4 gets in. It's carried by X3 because we treat them as a set of two variables. So, if you remember earlier, I said that we have the number of features added up here in this F ratio. We're averaging the change in SSC across the number of features we added. Well, in this case, because the number of beds was so significant that the number of bathrooms kind of came along for the ride. Kind of see how that works? So we have to be careful how we build these models, but you can compare models based on more than one variable difference. And here we can see that in this case, a variable get, got in this way that didn't when we were doing one at a time. So a quick reminder and we'll wrap this up. The total sum of squares, the SST is fixed once the rows are fixed. The sum of squares for the model, the SSR, will never go down as variable features are added. So regression and other models, you just keep dumping features into them. It'll take them, it's like a sponge. It'll say, give me all your features, give me all your features. And it will keep trying to reduce SSE and increase SSR. And it will take all the variables unless you tell it to stop. So the sum of squared errors, SSE will never go up as variables are added. It can stay the same or go down. So adding variable features will either have no effect or reduce the error. Regression will add all features unless stopped by a rule. So when we had that 0 0.05 rule, that was our rule. So dumping in all features can lead to overfitting and unnecessary complexity in our model, which we want to avoid. And of course, features can be added more than one at a time, sort of as a set, so long as all the features in the simple model are in the more complex model. Sweet, that was awesome. So again, this video was great for you getting that basic understanding about what's going on under the hood, the fundamental process by which we build regression models. And a lot of this can be extended into other techniques as well about how we add features and how that affects the sum of squares due to the, in the error and in the model itself how we can avoid overfitting, and how we can decide whether or not adding that feature actually gives us anything on that balance, right? So this will set us up for learning more about things like forward selection, backward elimination, stepwise regression, best subsets, and some of those other techniques that will go into uh, even deeper dive into those specific things. So I hope you found this video helpful, that it contributed to your fundamental understanding of statistics and model building, and I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.